بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما والله بأسك الله to grant us knowledge that is beneficial to us and to increase us in that. Al Bab al Sadis, the sixth chapter tonight, be Ibn Allahi Ta'ala. Last week we did the fifth chapter, which was the, the Da'wah to Shahada to Allah ilaha illallah. We just we explained and we spoke all about calling to the Shahada. We came with proofs, we came with explanations what is meant by calling to the Shahada. The next chapter, which is uh, Bab Tafsir al Tawheed, wa Shahada to Allah ilaha illallah. The chapter which deals with the tafsir of Tawheed, which is the meaning or the explanation of what is Tawheed and the Shahada of La ilaha illallah. So, why this chapter now? What is the, is this chapter appropriate right now? Most definitely it is. We learned before what is Tawheed, um, the, the virtue of Tawheed, the merits of Tawheed, the rewards for those people who perfect Tawheed, we learned why you have to be fearful of the opposite of it, which is shirk. Then we studied the importance of calling to Tawheed. But before you can call to something, you must know the reality of that thing. Right? So in this chapter, the author, Rahimahullah, um, he mentions certain ayat. Four ayat and one hadith. Four ayat and one hadith, which explains to us, which helps us to understand what is meant by Tawheed and what is meant by the Shahada of La ilaha illallah. So in the chapter, or firstly in the heading, it says explaining <coughs> Tawheed and Shahada. Why does he do that? To explain to us that that, 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 that Tawheed and the Shahada is the same thing. The Shahada of La ilaha illallah is Tawheed and Tawheed is the Shahada of La ilaha illallah. And no person should, should think that they are, that they are separate and that they are not the same thing. So, the first ayah that he brings is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ يَبْتَغُونَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمُ الْوَسِيلَةَ أَيُّهُمْ أَقْرَبُ Okay, so first and foremost, a background to the ayah. Who was the ayah revealed? Regarding who was the, this ayah revealed? It was revealed um, regarding people who used to worship Al-Masih. Who is Al-Masih? Arabic, the word Al-Masih means? <coughs> Nobody know? The Messiah, meaning? Jesus Christ of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. It was revealed regarding people that used to worship Isa and used to worship his mother. And likewise, they used to worship Uzair. Who was Uzair? Uzair, who worshipped Uzair? Which people worshipped this man known as Uzair? The Jews. Allah says in the Quran, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ In another verse, Allah says, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ عُزَيْرُ نِبْنُ اللَّهِ وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَ الْمَسِيحُ بِنُ اللَّهِ Allah says the Yahud, they used to say that Uzair is the son of Allah. And the, Yahud, the Nasara, they used to say that Al-Masih is the son of Allah. The Messiah, meaning Isa alayhi salam is the son of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is far above such beliefs. And then, regarding these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah. Right? Who has the ayah in front of them? Everybody have the verse in front of them? Somebody read us the translation of the verse. Okay, do we understand what this verse means? Allah is speaking about those people who you used to worship, those beings that you used to worship from the pious men, from Uzair, from the Masih, from the angels that you used to worship, you used to invoke them, you used to supplicate towards them. They themselves are worshippers of me. That's what Allah is telling us. They themselves are my worshippers. 
They are in need of me. They are in need of me and I am not in need of them. Right? They themselves seek to draw close to me. They worship me. They obey me. <coughs> and why does Allah clarify this? He clarifies this to show us that if these beings, these men, these angels themselves are slaves of Allah, then a slave can never ever be something that is worshipped. A slave can <coughs> never ever be fitting of being, of being worshipped. So Allah clarifies in this verse that those same people that you worship, that you made dua towards, that you called for help, that you called unto them for help, that you put your trust in them, they themselves are my worshippers. They themselves seek to, to, to draw close to me. Subhanallah. Okay? And Allah says about them, يَبْتَغُونَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمُ الْوَسِيلَةَ أَيُّهُمْ أَقْرَبُ What does wasila mean? Wasila. I think we have mentioned this verse before. Or this word before. Wasila. Trust. Trust? No. Tawassul, wasila. Tawassul, have you heard? We've spoken about tawassul before, right? Eh? To go through something, somebody said. That's correct, right? So, watch, 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 watch. watch, watch. Right? To go through something or meaning, in other words, to seek a means of access, to seek a shortcut, basically. Right? So people would seek uh, shortcuts in various ways to get to Allah, to, and we'll mention this now, right? So Allah says, these beings, these angels, these uh, men that you worship, they themselves sought, they themselves sought <coughs> a means of access to me. Meaning, they themselves try to get as close as possible to me. Ayyum akrab, to see who of them can be closest to me. Why do they do this? To see, or, or they would compete with each other or with themselves to try and be as close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as possible. So what's meant by wasila in this context is that they would do as much uh, good deeds. They would worship Allah as much as they possibly could to try their best to get as close to Allah as possible. This is what Allah says about these beings that they used to that they used to worship. And then Allah says, وَيَرْجُونَ رَحْمَتَهُ وَيَخَافُونَ عَذَابَهُ These beings, Masih, the, the Masih, Isa, Uzair, as great as they were, they themselves, they feared Allah's punishment. They sought the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this again shows us that they were truly the slaves of Allah. Completely in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, how is it possible that you can take them as your, as your, as your gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's what Allah is saying in this verse. So, wasila, the word wasila, it means to seek a means. Right? To seek a means to find a way to draw closer to Allah, right? In this context, it means, what did we say it means? Worship and obedience <coughs> to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Shaykh Fawzan, he makes a very important clarification. And he says, wasila is not what some people think it is, but some people from the grave worshippers and those people who have gone astray, what they think wasila is. So they would use these verses, for example, and as a proof for themselves to show that you can you can make dua to these people as a wasila to your Rabb. You can make a dua by these people as a means to gain access to Allah, to get closer to Allah. This is how the, the grave worshippers have misinterpreted these ayat. So basically what they did is they likened Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the creation. So they would say, for example, the same way that you cannot just call and to supplicate or ask a king or a leader for help, likewise you cannot just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. You cannot just ask Allah for your needs. To get to the king, you need to write letters, you need to send it via, via the correct <coughs> channels, the ministers and to this and until it might, might reach the king. Likewise, you cannot just make dua to Allah. You have to go via the correct channel. And that is that you make dua to the Salihin. That is that you ask these righteous people to make dua on your behalf. That is how you get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is their understanding of wasila. Seeking a means, seeking a means of access towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way. Right? So they get 
they <coughs> they do various acts of worship towards you know the dead towards all of these things what is the excuse this is our wasila to get closer to allah because we cannot get closer to allah directly rather allah is like a king that you cannot just go and call unto him you have to go via the correct wasila the correct means the correct channel this is how the the grave worshippers interpret this 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 ayah and this word wasila and this is how it is misinterpreted rather the correct and the clear understanding is that what's meant by wasila is that they sought closeness to allah through their acts of worship <coughs> through their obedience to him and to him alone subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> We've mentioned, we've spoken about wasila in Nawaqidul Islam. When we spoke about the nullifiers of Islam, the second nullifier was, who remembers? Who remembers? What was the second nullifier? The first nullifier was shirk. The second nullifier was something very similar to shirk, or it's a type of shirk, but the author basically highlighted it even more. Which was it? What was it? <coughs> The second nullifier of Islam was that you create, that you have between yourself and Allah an intermediary. You make dua to them. You ask them for the intercession. That you put your trust in them. That's the second nullifier that we mentioned. Right? And we mentioned on this nullifier the ayah in Surah, Surah Zumar. Right? The ayah in Surah Zumar where Allah says about them, those who worshipped. Those who took awliya other than Allah. Ma'na'buduhum. What was the excuse? What was the excuse? We do not worship them except that they bring us closer to Allah. Except that they bring us closer to Allah. This is a type of wasila. They're seeking the means to Allah via asking the dead. Putting the trust in the dead. Uh, seeking intercession via the dead. In another verse, in another verse, Allah says about them, وَيَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ ما لا يضرهم ولا ينفعهم. They worship from other than Allah, that which doesn't benefit them, nor nor that which does not harm them, nor does it benefit them. ويقولون. And what do they say? What's the excuse? هؤلاء شفاعاء عند الله. These are our intercessors with Allah. These things that we worship, these kramas that we call unto, these awliya that we make dua to, these are our intercessors with Allah. They will intercede for us with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this Allah clarifies in the Quran already. That these people are people of shirk and people of complete misguidance. So important point to note on this <coughs> verse. That when this word wasila is mentioned, it is not what these people interpret it to mean. Rather they have completely changed the ayah, completely warped the meaning of wasila. So there is wasila, types of the wasul that is permissible. Types of tawassul that is permissible. Do we know them? One, two, three of them? To be alive. To be alive. Meaning, what is tawassul? Tawassul is <coughs> that you, you, you seek a means of access, like we said, to have your dua accepted, to have your deed accepted, etc. Right? So, we believe to go, go make your tawassul via the dead, that's shirk. Right? You must ask Allah directly. But there are other things that you can use, tawas, types of tawassul that you can use, types of uh, things that will get you, that will help you in having your dua <coughs> to be accepted. Do we know of any of them? Um, the use of a good deed. The use of a good deed, excellent. Right, the use of a good deed. So the story of the people, or the, those men who were trapped in the cave. in the cave. What happened to them? The stone blocked, the massive rock blocked the, the entrance, they couldn't get out. So... They made dua, each one of them made a dua. And each one of them mentioned, Ya Allah, I did this particular deed, or I stayed away from this particular haram, <coughs> when I could have done it. I could have easily done it, but because of you, because for your sake it was completely sincere, and Allah accepted their duas like this. So when you make dua, and this is something that is not to be done every single day. You see, these people had a need. Because you don't use your good deeds all the time as, you know, as a bargain. Ya Allah, I did this. I sat in a class today. I went to madrasa today. I went to masjid today. Please give me this. You know, you're starting to use your deeds as a bargain. You're trying to win over 
because of so we don't use that right but when you when you when you have a need <coughs> when there's a need like this people will attract that is when you mention ya allah you know i stood up for qiyamul layl last night it was cold i stood up it was raining but for your sake i, I prayed two three four rakats you know because of that you know give me shifa because of that help me with my task today because of that etc so this is a type of tawassul that is completely permissible because we have proof for it <coughs> that's why it's permissible because there's proof in the story that that's what these men did and the duas were accepted right a second type of tawassul that's permissible to a loving person to a to a so you go to someone who you believe is righteous a learned person that you believe this is a good person you genuinely believe and you have a particular need once again you say to him look please make dua for my son he's not well please make dua for my wife she's not well please make dua for my mother uh, or please make dua for my business things are difficult whatever the case may be <coughs> you go to somebody who is alive alive is the key word and you believe that he's righteous and you ask him you know please make dua for me when you have the time you know etc but you also shouldn't be of those people who every single person they meet you know, make dua for me make dua for me mm-hmm. you make dua for yourself that's the asl that's the, the, the that's where we start to fulfill right we make dua for ourselves but like i said when there's a need <coughs> when you come across someone that you really feel and believe this is a good righteous person <coughs> then there's no there's no harm in asking them <coughs> to make dua for you for for a particular need that you have bismillah <coughs> the third type of tawassul is Anybody? Allah says in the Quran, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا <coughs> The names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says to him, to Allah belongs Asma'u al-Husna. The most beautiful and perfect of names. فَدْعُوهُ <coughs> بِهَا So make dua to Allah through them. Make dua through these names. <coughs> and we can check in the attributes of Allah as well because They belong to Allah, they are perfect. So, the names and attributes of Allah, that is the third or one of the types of tawassu that is completely permissible and highly recommended. <coughs> There's no limit to using them. The more you use them, the more chance your dua will be accepted. Fad'uhu biha, meaning make tawassu with them. Seeka means to have your dua accepted through these names and attributes of Allah. So, when you want mercy, you mention the correct attribute. Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Arham Ar-Rahimin. Oh, the most merciful, oh, the most compassionate. Oh, Arham Ar-Rahimin is what? The, the most merciful of those who have mercy. Akram Al-Akramin, the most kind of those who are kind. <coughs> These are the ways we should be addressing Allah. Ya Ghaffar, the one who forgives every single sin. Ya Ghaffur Ar-Rahim, the oft forgiving, the oft merciful, forgive us. This is how we should make dua. And likewise, when you want to be <coughs> saved from the fire, address Allah, you are the most merciful, you are the most kind, you are the most gentle, you know, save us, protect us, etc. Likewise, the, you use the appropriate name and attribute for your dua to be accepted, and this is one of the best ways to have your duas accepted, inshaAllah. So those three are the three types of tawassul that are permissible, via the names and attributes of Allah. Um... The dua of a righteous, loving person. And thirdly, that you mention one of your good deeds, that you ask Allah to grant you whatever <coughs> you need because of this deed that you did, or that you done. This is tawassul that is mashru' that is legislated and completely permissible in the sharia. Other than it, is not allowed. Other than this, it's not allowed. Why? Because there is no proof to state that these other types of tawassul are allowed. Some of them are tantamount to major shirk. As we pointed out, when people go to the graves and they make dua to them, believing this is tawassul. They are trying to have the dua accepted through the dead. This is shirk akbar, major shirk. Then you get types that are maybe minor shirk. And I reckon, I think that tawassul will come up later on and we will discuss them further inshallah <coughs> ta'ala. So as for the tawassul that's mentioned in this, this verse, the Quran and the Sunnah of here is at-ta'a wal-ibadah. It's obedience and it is ibadah. It is worship, right? That we worship Allah. And through our worship, through our obedience, Allah will grant us what we will become. We'll get closer to Him. 
<laughs> will get closer to him. And this is what Allah has basically said about these slaves of his, that these people are making dua to. These are, this is the reality of them. Right? Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ When my slave asks you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi about me, inform him that I am Qareeb. I am nearby, I am near. I am the one who answers the call of the one when he calls. When he makes dua, I am there, I am near, and I answer his call. There is no need to ask anybody else besides Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. The door of Allah is open night and day. He is close to his slaves, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he is never ever absent. <coughs> Nothing is hidden from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the hadith, Sahih Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that every single night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends in a manner that befits him during the last third of the night. Every single night he descends and he calls out and he says, Hal min sa'ilin Is there anybody that's there asking of me? So that I can give him. Hal min da'in Is there any person making dua to me so that I can answer his dua? Hal min Is there any person making istighfar, seeking my forgive, seeking forgiveness from me such that I can forgive him? Hal min ta'ibin Is there any person making tawbah so that I can accept his tawbah? This the, the Prophet says happens every single night. Every single night Allah comes down and He calls out. He calls out seeking, looking who is there so that I can give, so that I can forgive, I can, I can accept His repentance, etc. Right? So it's upon each Muslim to really try and maximize that time of the day, that time of the night rather. The last third of the night before Fajr, right? It is a blessed time and it's one of the best times for dua. All of these, you know, that's one hadith. That is one ayah that we mentioned. What do they show us? Allah is looking to accept our du'as. He's looking to answer our prayers. He's looking to forgive us. He's calling out. Where are they? Is there any person looking for forgiveness? That's why the ulama have said, those who don't worship Allah directly, those who still have the audacity to call on a dead person, what is it that they think of Allah? The reality is, they don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they haven't thought well of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have evil and bad thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyib. In this verse is also, what also, and this is why the verse is included in this top, in this chapter, it shows us the meaning of la ilaha illallah. And that is, that no one should be made to to except Allah. And that you should take no intermediaries, there should be no intermediaries taken between Allah and between His between his slaves. <clears throat> so whoever takes, whoever has an intermediary between Allah and himself, then he has not understood the meaning of La ilaha illallah. That's what this ayah is showing us. That those who have intermediaries, they truly don't understand what La ilaha illallah means. <clears throat> then the second verse. The second verse Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ لِأَبِيهِ وَقَوْمِهِ إِنَّنِي بَرَاءٌ مِّمَّا تَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا الَّذِي فَطَرَنِي Right, once again, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Khalilullah, mentioned over and over in the Qur'an. And Allah always praising him and commands us to follow him and his way. The father of the Anbiya, which, who was the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibrahim alayhi salam when he said to his father and his people he started way at home he started his da'wah way at home with his father and then he went to the rest of his people who was this people that he was sent to they used to worship stars right they used to worship stars and their king was Nimrud or Numrud that was the king of the time He's the one Allah speaks about in the Quran. Allah says, Do you not look at, do you not see the one who debated with Ibrahim concerning his Rabb? This king, he debated with Ibrahim. And he rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely. And <coughs> from there, Allah mentions the arguments that they had. Uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam says to him, Rabbi alladhi yuhi wa yumit. My Lord is the one who gives life 
and gives death. He takes life. So what did this man, Numrud, say? Ana uhi wa umid. I'm the one who also gives life and takes life. So what did he do? He killed people as he pleased and he allowed people to live. He said, I'm the one who gives life and takes life. So Ibrahim alayhi salam said to him, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ قَالَ Ibrahim, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْتِي بِالشَّمْسِ مِنَ الْمَشْرِقِ Verily Allah, he is the one who brings the sun from the, from the east. So he tells him, فَأْتِ بِهَا مِنَ الْمَغْرِبِ You bring the sun now from the west. فَبُهِتَ الَّذِي كَفَرَ And this is where his, his disbelief was completely destroyed. Ibrahim debated with him with knowledge and he completely destroyed him and his, his claims. See, Allah brings the sun from the east, now you bring it from the west. This man had no ability, no real abilities that he claimed to have. So Ibrahim, this was the people that he was sent to, the people of Numrud. And he said to them, Innani bara'u mimma ta'budun. I am completely free, I cut myself off from all of that which you worship. Your idols, your stars, etc. إِلَّا الَّذِي فَطَرَنِي Except for the one who created me. What is Ibrahim doing here? Completely cutting himself off, freeing himself, making himself innocent from all of these false deities. إِلَّا الَّذِي فَطَرَنِي Except for the one who created me, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِنَّهُ سَيَهْدِينَ And he is the one who will guide me. And Shafuzan says, this once again is the meaning of La ilaha illallah. The whole chapter we are speaking about here is what does La ilaha illallah mean? So this is what La ilaha illallah means. <clears throat> explain. Who can explain? Based on this verse, the short verse that we just mentioned. How does that equate to La ilaha illallah? We've spoken about nafi and itbat before. Affirmation and negation. Right? That's basically what we're talking about here again. Can someone explain? Ibrahim cut himself off from all of those false gods and he said, except for those who, or for, for the one who created me, literally he will guide me. Shaykh Ozan says, that's the meaning of la ilaha illallah. How so? Someone can explain that. Break it down. Break the statement la ilaha illallah down into two. You break it down into two segments. Number one is La ilaha La ilaha That first segment is the The nafi Something known as nafi in Arabic which is Negation La ilaha is complete negation Okay That's we are trying to understand what this, this kalima means La ilaha Complete negation Of what? Of any ilaha Any possible god Anything that's worthy of worship so that's what Ibrahim said. I am completely free and I cut myself off and innocent from all of that which you worship. You understand? That's number one. Illa Allah. Except Allah. And what did Ibrahim say? Illa Allah fatarani. Except for the one who created me. So this is what la ilaha illallah means. That you completely disbelieve in every single thing. Every single thing. Except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we go on tonight, we will see the importance of this understanding. This understanding the kalima in this way is very, very important. Right? It's very, very important. <coughs> so we learn this from this ayah. Right? And this is the tafsir of la ilaha illallah. Which means, or by the meaning of, tarq ibaratul asnam al barat. That you completely leave off the worship of every idol, every single thing. And that you completely turn away from it. That you sincerely worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. <coughs> then Shaykh Fawzan says that as for those people who worship Allah, those people who, who worship Allah, but they also worship with Allah, and they also worship alongside Allah, other things, then these people haven't understood, haven't uh, grasped what la ilaha illallah means. Even if they utter it with their mouths, he said. Even if they utter it with their tongues. They say, La ilaha illallah. But they go to the graves. They say, La ilaha illallah. They go there and they seek their needs from these things. They start rubbing these graves. They start seeking help. Seeking madad, madad. And this is so common today, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. And, وَيَطُوفُ بِهَا They go and they make tawaf around these graves. So he says, these people, لَمْ يَتَبَرَّأْ مِنَ الشِّرْكِ they never cut themselves off from shirk, even though they utter la ilaha illallah. 
What did Ibrahim firstly say? I am completely free from all of that which you worship, except for the one who created me. These people, they did not cut themselves off from shirk. So therefore, لا تنفعه لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله doesn't benefit them at all. Even if they say it thousands of times. Because لا إله إلا الله is not just a statement that we utter. It's not just, you know, a statement that we, that we say with our tongues. Rather, it has conditions, it has connotations, it has a meaning that we have to understand properly. And that is to worship Allah and to free ourselves from shirk and the mushrikeen. <coughs> and then he says, as for those who do not free themselves from shirk, they haven't implemented la ilaha illallah. Even if they utter it with their tongues and even if they, you know, they, they, they mention this in their dhikrs throughout the day. They mention this throughout the day. He says, some of them have with them a tasbih, is what we, a subha in Arabic, a subha, what we know is in our culture is, an, is a tasbih, you right? know? He says, it's so long. They are saying, and yet, huh? right? They have this long tasbih with them. And they are reciting various dhikrs, and they are repeating la ilaha illallah thousands and thousands of times. He says, it doesn't benefit them at all. There is no benefit them in this at all until they do what Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam did. And that is to completely cut off and free themselves from all types of shirk. Right? And this is why I said it's very important to understand this. It's very important that we understand the nafi and his path. Negation and affirmation. Then the ayah carries on. Allah says, وَجَعَلَهَا كَلِمَةً بَاقِيَةً Allah made this kalima, this word, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ بَاقِيَةً فِي عَقِبِهِ Everlasting in the offspring of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. So, Shaykh Ozan explains basically that this word and those people who properly and truly understand that la ilaha illallah means it will forever be there. There will always be people of Tawheed around. People who understand what is the correct understanding of Tawheed. Even if they are very, very few. Even if they are very, very few, but there will always be people of Tawheed around. Because... The Ard will not be destroyed or Qiyamah will not begin until there is no believers left. So as long as there is a believer, Qiyamah will not begin. And therefore we understand from this that there will always be people of Tawheed around, even if there are few. But Allah says in this verse that He made this kalima, the statement of La ilaha illallah of Ibrahim, Baqiyah. It will forever and ever remain. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ So, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he cut off from these people, he completely, you know, moved away, hoping that they will come back. And as Sheikh Fuzal mentions, this has happened, alhamdulillah. Many of the offspring of Ibrahim, they've come back to Tawheed. They've left off the idol worship, the shirk, all of that, and they have come back to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, alhamdulillah. And he says, this is undoubtedly from the rahmah of Allah. Allah could have easily punished them. Easily said, look at these people of Shifan Shirk and just cast them out forever. And, you know, abandon them forever. But Allah, yet He made this message, a message that, inshallah, they come back. And as many of them, alhamdulillah, have come back. And in this is also an, you know, an incitement for us to complete, to continue calling people. Because there's always a hope that, bi'ithnillah, they will understand what is meant by this kalima and they will come back bi'idhnillah to the kalima insha'Allah. The third ayah that we have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اتخذوا أحبارهم وروحبانهم أرباب من دون الله That they took the scholars and the monks as lords besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They took the scholars and the monks as lords <coughs> alongside or instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this was found once again amongst the Jews and the Christians. The Jews and the Christians, they took the monks and the, the scholars as lords besides Allah. How was this done? In what way did they take them as lords? How did they make them deities of worship? The scholars and the monks. Okay, that's maybe one way, yes. Other way, the Prophet sallam, explained this to us in a hadith. He explained this to us, to us in a hadith. There was a companion, Adi ibn Hatim, 
radiyallahu an Adi ibn Hatim Hatim radiyallahu an He came to the Prophet sallam and this ayah was recited ittakhadhu ahbarahum ruhbanam arbaba min dunillah right so Adi he used to be a Christian before before he became a Muslim and he had a problem with this ayah because he says to the mission of Allah ya Rasulullah lasna na'buduhum we do not worship them so Adi was a a Christian he said to the Prophet sallam we do not worship them right so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said alaysu yuharrimuna ma ahalla Allah fatuharrimuna qala bala he says alaysu do they not make or prohibit that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made halal do they not do that and he said yes <coughs> and he said and do they not make halal but Allah made haram and therefore they become halal he said yes the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says fatilka ibadatu this is the worship this is worshiping them that you follow them in what making halal haram and haram halal so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came and we know the rules were set out this is halal and haram these scholars then came and changed things decided no that's not haram anymore you know this is like that and this is like that and this the scary thing is we have scholars like that in within the muslim ummah today who are making everything halal music is halal nowadays intermingling is halal according to some nowadays you understand many things that's har- haram they've made halal right and this in reality is a type of kufr it's a type of disbelief when you try to when you purposefully change the sharia you know this is as Rashid bin Baz rahimahullah to say a person who says for example that the hijab is not wajib he's a kafir he's a kafir out of all of Islam because hijab is agreed upon it's known it's fard for a woman to wear hijab for him to come and say no it's not fard this person has left the fold of Islam so this is what their scholars would do and they would follow and obey their scholars in this Allah says about them they took their scholars and their monks as lords besides Allah meaning because they obeyed them in this in changing the legislation in changing the haram to halal and the halal to haram an important point here is that um, if any person believes that to change the, the legislation as I said to make haram halal or haram or halal haram if you believe this is something permissible then this person is out the fold of Islam any person who believes this is something that's okay this person is out the fold of Islam right you know if I think of one sect that really falls into this so much it is the modernists modernists they take so much things on the Sharia and change it because we are living now in the 21st century so it's not befitting for men to wear beards it's not befitting for women to dress like this it's not befitting for this and befitting for that according to their minds so they make things which is agreed upon they change the rulings now to suit them in this world right i've seen a modernist woman write on the internet that uh, to slaughter sheep and animals in your mind it's not permissible slaughtering animals this is an agreed upon thing that's completely permissible to slaughter for the sake of allah and here she comes and says it's not allowed because her mind has been what by these, I don't know what, what groups of people are, but to them, it's not humane to, to be slaughtering animals. That's cruelty. You understand? So they change the ruling. This is kufr akbar. To say this takes a person out to follow Islam completely. When I order billah, so these things are real, and especially I feel amongst the modernists, where they change things so so much to suit their their new agendas and to suit their new belief systems. But. Uh, Sheikh Hussain explained, so if you believe this is something permissible to do, to change the rulings, then this is known as major kufr takes out the fold of Islam. If you believe that to change halal to haram um, is not allowed, it only belongs to Allah, this is the right of Allah, but you still do it out of your desires. You still, you know, you know it's haram, but you still do it out of your desires. Then we say, this is a great great sin. Right? But you know it's not allowed. Do we understand the difference? You understand the difference? Explain the difference, Ekwalid. 
The difference is the first group of people come and says to change hal haram to halal or halal to haram is permissible. We say this belief takes you out the fold of Islam. Understand? The second group of people come and say that it's not allowed to actually change haram to halal or halal to haram. It's not allowed. This only belongs to Allah. This is His right. But we will still do it because we feel there's a need for it. You understand? Uh, could be in your own personal capacity. It could be uh, even like uh, someone, something else. Could be um, something which is haram. Let's say music is haram, but we need to listen to music now. We make it permissible because certain types of music remind you of Allah. Maybe something like that. Or we will include this music in our dhikr, and that makes it permissible. And like that. For example, I'm, I'm thinking off the top of my head here, but they feel that there's a benefit in changing the ruling. You with me? But they actually, they, they, they know that this is still the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What they're doing is technically not right, but they feel that, they, you know, they, they're doing it for purpose of benefit. <laughs> No, okay, fine. It's males and women, uh, males and females, but women should be married, not to males, but to females. Huh? Not married. Either way, but, but they, but everybody can hear it because they put it on CDs, and they sell these things, and out things. So what's the difference between that and going on Popeye? Just for instance. So you mentioned Nashid and Qasidas and Qadat, for example, was mentioned. In a way, that does apply. That does apply. It applies to who? To people who I will believe that these things are not. Allowed, but we will do it because of unity. For example, do you understand? So you get people who believe no, there's no such thing as hadith in Islam, but because it brings people together, we will do it. You see, I believe it's an innovation, but because of it brings unity, we will do it in any case. So in this case, we don't say this is kufr, because they know what they're doing is technically not allowed, but they feel that there's benefit in it. This is following their desires, and this is a major sin. This is a major sin, but it's not tantamount to shirk or tantamount to kufr, which takes a person out of all of Islam. Do we understand the difference? Right? Important to understand the difference. The first group thinks it's okay to change. So that's kufr. The second group says it's not okay to change, but, you know, because we're doing this, there is some benefit in it, so we're going to do it in any case. So that is a major sin, because you have not followed the sharia of Allah. Right? Um, so what does the ayah prove to us? This ayah, It teaches us what? That part of the tafsir of Tawheed and Shahada to Allah ilaha illallah is that no one is to be obeyed except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in with regards to halal haram. Um, just one question, Sheikh, um, regarding the second part, um, when you compromise your deen, um, where Allah also says in the Quran that, um, that they have sold their religion but for a small price, wouldn't that apply? Uh, possible, yes. Selling their religion for a small price, meaning they want fame, they want monetary gain, they want this, they want that. So they, they leave off what's oh, that which they so know is... Well, like like Sheikh said, maintain unity, wouldn't that also fall under that? Possibly. Perhaps Allah A'lam. Allah A'lam. Okay? Come back to the verse. They have taken the monks, the scholars as lords besides Allah. How does this fit into Tawheed and Shahada to Allah ilaha illallah? What does this show us? What does this explain regarding Tawheed? It explains that... No one is to be obeyed. No one is to be obeyed with regards to halal and haram except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whosoever obeys the creation in their making of halal and their making of haram, they have taken them as a rub, as a lord alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do we understand that? So doesn't that... As, as as those who basically legislate, make things halal, make things haram, yes. that, that, that's taking them as a rob, right? But as I said, it's shirk, yes. But as we said, that there is a difference in when you believe that this is actually not allowed. You understand? But you follow your desires. So therefore it's a major sin. Definitely it's a major because you follow your desires. 
You are acting against these rules. So when you commit zina, you are acting against these rules. So it can't be shirk. Let's take a person who might commit zina. So your belief and your action needs to be the exact same thing. Definitely. Because I believe he's right, although I'm still going to do what's wrong. It's, it's not so bad. As if I'm it's not shirk, but it's a sin. It's not bad. Take... <laughs> Take, take, take another sin. Let's, let's leave this one or following halal haram. Take zina, for example. Someone has zina with some, uh, another person that, you know, it's haram, major sin, right? Does he know it's haram? All Muslims know zina is haram. How many Muslims have committed zina? Millions, right? So when they commit zina, are they committing shirk as well? By going against the laws of Allah? They follow their desires. They know it's haram, but they're still doing it. You understand the difference? But the moment someone comes and says, you know what, in today's day and age, zina is okay. Because, you know, uh, it's going to happen anyway, or at least now we know who the children are sleeping with. Allah Musta Right? Today you find parents, okay, not maybe not that, that extreme, but today the parents say, we know where the children are, they're at the club, it's okay. As long as we know where they are. We know the children are going out with this one and that one, that they, you know, they, so it's okay. And I know of personal incidents, my father was a teacher at, at one of the Muslim schools here. And this is what we used to hear. When they used to, you know, call the parents in and say, you know, your, this is what happened. Your child was caught with another girl or boy, you know, around the corner there, catching on this and that. Uh, they say, yeah, we know that's happening. But it's because we, allow, that we allow it in our homes because we, as long as we know what's happening, it's okay. This is the mentality of Muslims out there today. So... Do we say that they have fallen into kufr? No, they know it's wrong. But because they're following their desires, because they feel that there's actually benefit in the children going out. They feel that there's benefit in dating. So, uh, does that mean that... You see, they're not changing the ultimate law of Allah. The ultimate law of Allah. Likewise, they know what they're doing is wrong. So, therefore, it becomes a major sin. I think the point that's also being made is there's no shirk involved. <coughs> you know, you're not ascribing any partners to Allah. You know? The shirk comes in when you believe that it's okay that the sheikh changed the, the, the religion now. Then, then it becomes shirk. It becomes shirk when you feel, if I came in here now and I said, look, um, let's remove this, this, this curtain here, because there's nothing wrong with men and women staring at each other. Example, not just for argument's sake. Or there's nothing wrong with intermingling, for example. You know? And you obey me in that. Then that's a type of shirk. Because you know what I'm doing. I'm changing a known ruling of the Sharia, for example. And therefore, this becomes shirk. This is the shirk that, that the Prophet wasallam said that the Jews and the Christians were guilty of. They obeyed their scholars in the changing of the, the rulings of Allah. You understand? But when they acknowledge what they're doing is not allowed, but they still do it anyway. This is now following your desire. The same with any other sin. Zina, riba, they know it's haram. They know that this is, but they still do it anyway. You understand? They still do it anyway. For example, riba. Riba is a good example. Riba, people will tell you that um, riba is haram. No, that's, everybody knows riba is haram. But how am I going to buy a car if I don't take out the bond? I need a car. You understand? So I have to take out the bond and to pay, you know, I have to take out a bond because there's benefit in that for me. You with me? Yeah. So they're still going to do the haram because of benefit in the haram that they feel is there that they have to have. So, in that is the same, like basically what we are saying here, that when you follow your scholar, so let's say a scholar said, it's okay to, to take out a bond because there's benefit in it. He says it's okay to take out a bond because there's benefit in it. So he's making haram halal, right? But we all ultimately believe that nobody can change the sharia. So you're following him in that ruling, where he has changed the ruling, believing that it's ultimately haram, but because of the benefit, we're going to do it. So in that case, we say it is a, a major sin for the scholar and for them. But the moment the scholar says it's okay, in today's day and age, it's okay. You know, take out the bond and indulge in riba, it's fine. That, and you follow him in that. Then this is shirk. Then you have taken him as a rab because you are following him in changing haram to halal. Is this understood?
Justifies riba. Justifies taking out insurance and property and things like that. Um, you know, he doesn't tell you you must outgo and do it, but his justification for it is that in this in this day and age, we uh, we fires are so quick and I don't know, I don't mm. know what whatever reason it is, but in this day and age, you should have insurance over your property. Um, yeah, uh, it depends on his reasoning. It depends on his reasoning. If he, if you see, for example, as I mentioned last week in the fifth class, there's a principle in the Sharia which he says, A necessity makes that which is haram, halal. Okay? So, someone asked about if you're stuck on an island and you've got nothing to eat except pork. In such a case, pork is halal. Do you understand? Likewise, wine would be halal if that's the only thing there is to drink. To save your life, that haram becomes Halal. That's a principle of the Sharia. Okay? So some people will interpret it, will interpret um, insurance to be like that. Or medical aid, for example. You with me? They will say that if you don't have medical aid, and you know this happens to you, then you will never be able to pay hospital bills because it's so expensive. And if you go public, for example, then you will put on this long waiting list before you can actually have your operation that you need to save your life, to save your, your legs. Uh, therefore, medical aid is a necessity. So, a necessity means even though it is haram in and of itself, it becomes halal in terms of necessity. You understand? You understand this principle? So, some scholars interpret these insurances to be necessity, and therefore it becomes permissible. So, it, it depends, man. It all depends. We need to look at the the finer details. Like you, go, I believe you cannot say in general it's a necessity. The necessity means there are rules regarding necessities, but this is where the reasoning of many scholars come from, that in certain places it is a necessity. Other places it's not a necessity. You understand? So, uh, with regards to the sheikh, I cannot comment because I don't know what his reasoning is. It could, it's most probably a necessity. That's probably his reasoning. Does that stand as a reasoning? Uh, Allah knows best, but I don't feel you can say, you know, make a blanket statement and say, all insurance is halal because... How can you do without it? Of course you can do without it. Many people, most people are doing without it in fact. And they're surviving. And necessity means that without this thing you can't survive. Without this thing you can't do without it. So someone knocks into your car, your car is still fine. You understand? You, you, you can still do without that car in fact. You know what I mean? And the problem with insurance, I don't want to go off topic here, but it, it takes away your trust from Allah. You start feeling everything safe and fine because... The car is insured. You understand? So no problem. Someone knocks me, it's okay. You get accidents, okay. Car is insured. You don't, you don't put your trust in Allah anymore. You don't have that tawakkul anymore. But anyways, that's a topic on its own. You don't want to get into, into that. Um, another verse that's similar to this issue. Allah says in the Quran, Am lahum shuraka. Do they have any partners? Shara'u lahum min al ma lam ya'lam billah. Who make things part of the deen. That which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not permitted. Do they have partners that make things part that, that make things part of the religion which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not permitted? Meaning they make things halal and haram. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't make these things halal and haram. Likewise, uh, bid'ah. People make do acts of worship that Allah never allowed. Allah never legislated. The Prophet never legislated. This question is posed to them as well. Do they have any partners that have legislated this thing to the religion? That which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not legislated. Right? That's a verse that can be used against the people of innovation. Verse that's chapter uh, Surah Shura, Surah to Shura, verse 21. Surah to Shura, verse 21. Right? So, what we learn here is once again that part of La ilaha illallah means none is to be obeyed in halal and haram except Allah and the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and likewise in acts of worship. No one is to be obeyed in acts of worship except Allah and the Messenger. This is part of the meaning of the kalima, la ilaha illallah. Those who are following innovations, those who are following other rulings, they are not following the la ilaha illallah as they are supposed to. The fourth verse, the author brings, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْ دَادَيْ يُحِبُّنَمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ From amongst the people are those who take, <coughs> who take partners alongside Allah. يُحِبُّونَهُمْ 
كحبه they love these partners the way that they love Allah سبحانه وتعالى right this is Allah is referring to the مشركين here that they are partners alongside Allah whom they love the way that they love Allah سبحانه وتعالى from this verse we learn number one that that love is actually an act of worship there is love a type of love that is an act of worship you get natural love like a husband and wife and if we're children etc that's love normal love but the love of ibadah the love of ibadah is something that should be for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone what does that mean love of ibadah the love to worship the love to worship we mentioned before a number of times i've mentioned this where ibn al-qayyim rahimahullah said that our worship is like a bird the head of it is love the two wings are what's the two wings fear and hope that's a, a believer is always between hope and fear but the head of it is love when we worship allah we worship him firstly out of love that you love the, the one who created you one who nourishes you sustains you given you every single thing brought you into existence when you were not even a thing that was mentioned on the tongues of men or, or you were not even a thought Allah brought you into existence he's given you every single thing that you have a roof on your head a family iman every single thing this should lead us to loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than we love any any person or anything else and because of that we should love to worship him we should love to attend classes and to learn his religion we should love to make salah love to read his words his quran love to pay to give sadaqah to him. this is the love of worship there are people who are mushrikeen they love others they have partners with allah whom they love the way that they love allah so they they acknowledge allah but they also love to go to graves and to make dua to the graves to make dua to the dead this is the type of mushrikeen that they are that they the same way that they love to worship allah and to humble themselves to allah they humble themselves to other than allah and you know you look at a, a grave worshiper when he goes to that grave you will see the most humble person he actually folds himself up and he puts his hands on his you know folds his arms and stands humbly submissively in front of this grave and he calls unto this thing sincerely from the bottom of his heart this is love of worship this is you know he humbles himself in front of this thing this the mu'minin the people of tawhid are like this with allah and allah alone we don't humble ourselves in front of people we go and make ourselves small that's not the way we believe we're not proud either but we don't we don't come in front of people and make yourself you know you humble yourself in front of people like a, almost like a beggar this is how you are with allah and allah alone you belittle yourself for allah you show allah you are perfect i am nothing we put our heads on the ground for allah and alone for allah alone right and so this is the way of the believers so allah says in the quran or the next as the ayah carries on وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا As for those who believe أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ They are more severe in their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone So Allah speaks about the mushrikeen They love to worship others the same way that they love to worship Allah As for the believers They are more strict and severe in their love for Allah and Allah alone Do we understand this verse? What's meant by the hub of ibadah the love of 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 ibadah and not like i said normal love that's perfectly fine that's normal that's how we were created but that's not what's meant here we are talking about the love to worship to to humble yourself in front of this being that's what we are that's what we are referring to over here how does this link in to what's meant by la ilaha illallah right that we understand that from the tafsir of la ilaha illallah and the tafsir of tawhid is that we single Allah out in our in our love that we single Allah out in our love and that we do not love along with him other than him or other than him the love of ibadah we don't want to worship anyone else we don't have that desire in our hearts to worship anyone but him and this is the love of ibadah that is solely for the sake of Allah lastly we have a hadith in sahih muslim the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said Um, whosoever says la ilaha illallah wa kafara bima yu'badu min dun Allah and he disbelieves in whatever is worshiped alongside Allah haruma maluhu wa damuhu wa hisabuhu ala Allah then his his wealth and his blood becomes haram and his 
uh, his affair basically is left to Allah. His reckoning is left to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyip. So, first and foremost, those who say, who utter, la ilaha illallah. Secondly, those who, again, disbelieve in everything besides Allah. Right? Those who, who, who fulfill these two conditions, they are those whose wealth and blood is haram to take. Meaning, no person can, no Muslim can go and take from him and, or kill him or anything like that. He is a Muslim. That's what this hadith is saying. This is the believer. Right? Um, <coughs> وَحِسَابُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ Then, if, you know, he was, he, was, he was sincere in this statement of his and he was a true Muslim, then he will enter Jannah Allah, and if he was just showing this off, he was a type of a munafiq, then Allah will deal with him appropriately. Allah says in the Quran, Inna al-munafiqeen fi al-darki al-asfari min al-nar. That one of the conditions of la ilaha illallah is that we say it sincerely. What does that mean? To say la ilaha illallah sincerely. What does that mean? To say from the heart of feelings was dealing with devotion. No, nope, I'm uh, to believe in La ilaha illallah sincerely with ikhlas, sincerity. What does that mean? What that means is that when you say, I believe in Allah, or I believe that there's none worthy of worship besides Allah, you make the statement, right? You live by the statement. You do it out of sincerity, meaning you do it for the sake of Allah, to please Allah. Many people will just say this because they're born Muslim. Brought that Muslim in a Muslim society. So I'm Muslim, I say la ilaha illallah. But we don't actually say it to please Allah. For the sake of Allah, I'm a Muslim. I'm not Muslim because I was born a Muslim and I live in a Muslim society, went to a Muslim school, I have a Muslim family, that's why I'm a Muslim. You understand this? I'm a Muslim because I truly want to be a Muslim for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. That's what we mean when we say with ikhlas, right? Um, so again, this hadith is similar to the ayah that we mentioned with regards to Ibrahim, right? The nafi and his bad. That's exactly what this hadith is teaching us once again. That for those people who say la ilaha illallah, but they do not disbelieve in, or they do not disbelieve in everything that is worship besides Allah, like the worshipping of graves or the making dua to the awliya, etc., then their wealth and their blood is not prohibited. Because these people haven't fulfilled Tawheed. Do you understand? They haven't come with the proper meaning of La ilaha illallah. They only came with one, which is La ilaha illallah. They say it, but they don't actually disbelieve in everything else beside that. <coughs> he said, in fact, some of them say that to worship graves is not shirk. To worship graves is not shirk. They don't even deem it to be shirk. So Shafuzan ends off and he says this hadith is one that is extremely great. And it is a proof for the muwahideen over those people of doubts and those people of shirk. Those people who say that whosoever says la ilaha illallah and he is a Muslim. No matter what he does. And this is again rampant in our society. People say no but he says la ilaha illallah is finished. He's a Muslim. He says la ilaha illallah is sufficient. Right? No matter what he does, he worships graves, he slaughters for the awliya, he does magic, he does everything. But he's a Muslim because he says la ilaha illallah. This hadith is a refutation against him. Because the hadith says, whosoever says la ilaha illallah, number one. Number two, wa kafara bima yu'badu min dunina. He completely disbelieves in everything that is worshipped besides Allah. And again, that's why I mentioned earlier, to understand the nafi and his bath. The affirmation and negation to, to, to break down la ilaha illallah into this two segments is very, very, very important because people don't understand this. The scholars today don't even understand this, right? So he says, for Zan says, as for those who say, uh, I don't disbelieve in, these, in, in them, in these people. And I do not just disbelieve in those who worship Hassan and Hussein. And I do not believe in those who say la ilaha illallah because they are our brothers. Right? Sheikh Hazan says, Akhta'u, these people are mistaken. These people are mistaken. He says, Naqulu lahu, we say to him, Anta mushrik mithlahum. You are mushrik just like them. You are a mushrik just like them. Because you don't 
said, you don't regard worshipping the dead as shirk. You don't regard calling on Hassan and Hussein as shirk. What does that make you? You are one of them. And wallahi, when I read this, I was I had shivers. And I was reading the explanation of Shufazan, really. Because if you look at again, look at the way people are, look at the majority of these Sufi sheikhs, and this is exactly what they do. You know, there was, uh, recently now, there's a, a famous guy here to one of the masjids. He was asked, in his Arabic class, somebody asked him, what's the ruling on making dua by the dead? So he said, um, I don't do it, but it's permissible. I don't do it, I don't make dua by the dead, but it's permissible. So you see, this answer is like a middle path answer to him. Number one, nobody can accuse me of shirk. Number two, the people who's doing it, they won't blame me either. You understand? So I'm okay, I'm safe from all sides. You with me? So his colleagues who are doing it, who are promoting it, they won't blame him because he said it's permissible. Those people who are saying it's shirk can't say he's a mushrik because he doesn't do it. You but see? It's shirk. But in reality, what we are saying here is that this hadith is a refutation against this type, this type of ignorance. That's an ignorant answer that he gave. He thinks it's a clever answer. In reality, it's an ignorant answer. Because the hadith says that number one, the one who says la ilaha illallah, but number two is the important point. The hadith says that he, you have to disbelieve in everything that is worshipped besides Allah. So when you say it's permissible, you have not disbelieved in that grave worship. So you are not a person of la ilaha illallah. You are not a person of la ilaha illallah. And that's what Shifuzan says. We say to these people, you are mistaken. But in fact, you are a mushrik just like them. You are the same like them whether you do it or not. Because your belief is completely incorrect. So really this point is so, so important that we understand. La ilaha illallah. Nafi itbat. Negation, affirmation. That's what this hadith is emphasizing. It's emphasizing that point over and over. There is none worthy of worship. I disbelieve in every single thing. Every grave worship, every tree worship, every sun, moon worship, every righteous person, which I disbelieve in them. Illa Allah, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Tawheed. This is Tawheed. This is complete negation of everything and affirming that Allah is the only one that is worshipped. This is what Allah says in the Quran as well. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Baqarah, verse 256. Allah says, فَمَن يَكْفُرْ بِالطَّاغُوتِ وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى Allah describes those who have taken hold of this handhold that will never break. What is this handhold that will never break? Tawheed, right? But what is it Allah says? Number one, فَمَن يَكْفُرُ بِالطَّاغُوتِ Those who disbelieve in the false gods. That's the first thing Allah says. وَيُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ And they believe in Allah. This is exactly what La ilaha They disbelieve in all the false gods Wa yu'min billah illallah Except that they believe in Allah alone This is the meaning of the shahada This is the meaning of tawheed Those who do not follow this Have not fulfilled tawheed They have not understood tawheed at all So therefore Shufuzan says Fala budda min al-kufr bil-tawhud It's a must that we completely Openly say That we disbelieve in these False gods. Everything that's worship besides Allah is a ta'ud. <coughs> and وَلَا بُدَّ مِنَ الْكُفْرِ بِمَا يُعْبَدُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ And as, as the hadith says, it's compulsory upon us that we disbelieve in everything that is worship besides Allah Azza wa Jal. And we believe that it is batid, it's falsehood. And we cut ourselves off from this belief and from the people of this belief. We don't hang around with such people. We don't sit with such people. We don't study with such people who say these type of things. That no, it's okay, but I, I wouldn't do it. Why would you not do it? That's another question. Why would you not do it? As we mentioned earlier, the three types of tawassul, right? We mentioned through the, your righteous deeds, through the Allah's names and attributes, and through the dua of a righteous person. What does tawassul do? It allows your dua to be accepted. It helps your dua to be accepted. Now, why would you not do this if you think it's permissible? That's like saying, I know that will help my dua be accepted, but I won't do it. It doesn't make sense. The answer is ignorant and it's also illogical completely. And that's because this person is trying to, like I said, blend in. 
to be safe from both sides, but in reality, he, he is falling into major error. <clears throat> and he says, if not for this, or this is how a person becomes a Muslim. This is what makes you a Muslim. This is the, the belief of the Muslim. And now he says, this is basically the difference between Islam and Kufr. And that Islam and Kufr, it doesn't combine. You can't mix Kufr and, 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 and Tawheed together. You can't mix Shirk and Tawheed together. Rather, you have to, you either here or you're there. Then the author ends of the chapter. And take, 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 take note of this. He ends of the chapter by saying, وَشَرْحُ هَذِهِ التَّرْجُمَةِ مَا بَعْدَهَا مِنَ الْأَبْوَابِ This is the first time at the end of the sixth chapter that we are reading words of the author. You understand that point? What we've been reading the whole time is what? Quran and Hadith. That's what's, uh, when, I, when we started this book, I said that's what makes the book so special. He's a, he writes the book, but he's barely written from himself. He basically just compiled it into chapters, a chapter of this, chapter of that, and he puts the relevant ayat in there. The commentaries then come with all the scholars' writings and explaining and explaining, and that's what we've been doing. But what makes the book so great is, that's all it is. That's Quran and Sunnah. And that's what we're taking our belief from. That's what we are studying from. Purely from Quran and Sunnah. Not from other opinions and other views and, you know, f- philosophies and all of this nonsense. This comes straight from the Quran and the Sunnah. So he ends off by saying that the explanation of this tarjama, meaning this, 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 this kalima, this la ilaha illallah, this explanation of this translation or this, this tafsir, the meaning of la ilaha illallah, ma ba'daha min al abwab, meaning as we're going through the book, all the, the, the chapters that come up will also add to the, the understanding of la ilaha illallah. Meaning the entire book is about tawheed or shirk. All of this will aid us and will, will add to the explanations of what is meant by la ilaha illallah. Next week, we move on to chapter number seven, which is about the chapter of um, types of shirk, where he says wearing rings and string and the likes of it is... To, to do away with bala, to do away with trials and tribulations. This is the type of shirk that will be explained next week. بإذن الله تعالى وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهد الله إلا أن تستغفرك وأتوب إليك